Before we look into the Word, let me pray for us. Invite the Holy Spirit, invite His presence to be with us as we look into the Scriptures. Oh God, we pray those last lines of what we've just sung, that your church would be filled with you and that this earth would understand and come to know your glory. Glory as of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, seen, present in our lives. Because of the likeness of Christ that is fashioned in us, a work of your Spirit in us to transform us from one degree of glory to the other. Lord, may this year be the year that is different and set apart from any other year in that respect. Grow us in likeness to Christ. Make your glory known to us and through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Here we stand at the beginning of 2021. It was, uh, it was strange to, to put that date on the sermon slides as I was sending them to uh, the, the, the Teams folder that we have. Um, so used to putting 2020. But, but maybe for some of you, it's like, oh, I'm so glad to put 2020 behind. And yet, as we look into a, a new year, some of the, the residue of maybe 2020 is kind of lingering in your heart. Um, we uh, look around and some things have changed and other things have not. And as we look into the future, there is there's still quite a bit of uncertainty, right? And for those of you who uh, up to this point have done a very good job at maybe setting some goals and expectations for, for your year, uh, maybe now at the onset of 2021, you're, you're kind of thinking about, what does this new year hold for me? And that's the that's the phrase or question I put on your sheet. What does what is, what is 2021 hold for you? You say, I've learned my lesson from last year. I'm not doing that again. What a waste of time that was. I mean, if you set goals or expectations related to you know, personal disciplines, I'm, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on a diet, I'm going to work out, I'm going to have more personal disciplines, I'm going to really build relationships, I'm going to come to know uh, my neighbors really well, I'm going to really serve and plug into the church. Well, whatever it might be, those goals that you may have had last year were perhaps unrealized, and, and those things were out of your control, by and large. <laughs> so, you know, you might have had every intention of going to the gym and even have tried to go to the gym, knocked on the door, doors are shut, they're locked, lights are turned out, sorry, try again next year. Or building relationships with your neighbors. That, that was actually one part of uh, our initiative last year, kind of drawing circles and, 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 and understanding how, how serving your neighbors and, and building into the, their lives and, and seeking to pray that God would, would give you opportunities to share the gospel. Maybe you had some of those opportunities, but, but by and large, even in my community, um, it was difficult, to say the least, <laughs> because of the concern of health and COVID and, and all of those other things and, and wanting to follow standards and protocols. And it was hard to really carry out and fulfill any of those objectives that you might have had. So as we look into 2021, you think, there's no reason why I would, I'm even going to try to do those things again. I, I, I don't have any certainty about what's coming. And so maybe what that does actually exposes a bit in our hearts the, the awkwardness of trying to create goals that are built on things that change. And so what I'd like to do this year is I would like to draw our attention. I would like to, us to focus on that which will never change. I would like us to anchor our security and our hope and our destination, our priorities to all be aligned and centered on and captured by the unchanging, undiminishing glory of God. 
And when we do that, you will have a life that is oriented on the things that not only matter, but the things that are unchanging and certain. The things that will be eternal and not temporal. The things that will be a given and you can find confidence and stability in rather than those things that are ever-changing, unstable, uncertain. I think in many ways, 2020 was a gift to us. Because what 2020 has done for us is, is, is strip away, perhaps, some of those things that we have found our security or hope in, that those things that we found that we could take pride in for ourselves, we could, in a sense, glory in that we have accomplished in some way. I can now bench press 250 pounds. Man, I am quite a guy. Or whatever your goal might have been. That wasn't my goal, by the way. <laughs> my goal was just to get to the gym, which it didn't happen, so... I'd like you to know there's something that you're made for. I want you to understand that there is a reason why you've been placed here. There is a, a person that created you that desires something to be true about you to your very inner core. He has ordered all of creation in such a way to call your attention to that which matters, to capture you with a picture and an image of himself that he has written everywhere you look because he is so interested in you seeing it for yourself. He wants to draw you in. He, he wants you to be captured by glory. So that's where we're going to go this morning as by way of introduction to try to help us walk into this and, and kind of set the stage, uh, maybe whet your appetite a little bit for, for what's coming this year in, in the hopes that you will come along with us in this journey of understanding the significance of, of the glory of God and, and being drawn in to what really matters, that which is eternal, that for which you were created for this is what you were made for. And so this is what we as a church want to pursue. To press in. Not to move on from 2020, but to, but to press in from the lessons that we have learned and, and seek to, to grow from, from those things that have been stripped away so that we can cling to the things that really matter. I want to try to answer some questions this morning as we walk through are the various passages that we'll address. And, and the second question is, what does it mean to be captured by glory? What are we talking about? I, I, that's, a, that's a nice phrase, but what does it really mean? What are you talking about, Andrew? Well, it may be helpful for us to, to define what glory is. And <laughs> to be quite honest with you, as I've walked through this week and I've, and I've tried to study and I've, I've really tried to be faithful in this. And it is, it is so immense of a subject, it is impossible to really define uh, in, in, in ways that are comprehensive and yet clear. But, but let me give it an attempt and I'm going to borrow from, from some, some really smart guys who will help us in this process. Paul Tripp defines it this way, and I think it's helpful. He says, glory isn't so much a thing as it's a description of a thing. And glory isn't part of God. It is all that God is. Every aspect of who God is and, and every part of what God does is glorious. It's just not one part of who God is. It's not just one of his attributes. It's the, it's the sum composite of, of all of his attributes. It's showing forth the radiance of his glory and beauty and splendor. As you look at the, at, the, at the comprehensive nature and essence of God, you say, wow, he is glorious. And truly, he is glorious. So in speaking of God, maybe this is a shorter summary when speaking of God glory is the manifestation of his presence glory is the manifestation of his presence meaning this is how God shows up to the world 
This is how God puts himself on display. This is how you see it wherever you look. God says, I'm here and I'm glorious. Look at me. And here's how he does it. This is how he shows himself to his creation. We find several verses throughout the Bible. We, we could spend the next week just reading through all the scripture from Genesis to Revelation that speak about him as a glorious God. But just a few to, to help whet your appetite again for, for what God does in, in making his glory known. Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. When you look at the, at the heavens, you say, wow, God is real. He must be real. I see this expanse, this uh, almost infinite expanse of stars and galaxies and, and how they're ordered and, and the beauty of them and the depth of them, and the relationship between the stars and, and all the other galaxies and planets that exist in, in our solar system and all the other solar systems that we have become aware of. It testifies of the, of the wonder and the splendor of who God is. It is God's self-disclosure. It's how God puts himself in full view of his creation. And where he seeks to arrest our attention and reveal himself to his creatures. But there's a problem with creation. It's deficient in its ability to, to send the comprehensive message of, of who is this one behind this power. I understand that he is a creative God. I understand that he's a powerful God. But, but who is he really? And Romans 1 begins to describe for us uh, the, the dilemma that, that creation uh, presents to those who recognize who God is, but don't know how to take the next step. Romans 1, 19 says, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and, and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. But here's the problem. Although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God or give thanks to Him, but became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. They were able to perceive some level of truth. They were able to understand through general revelation that God was, was setting himself as the one to whom they should worship, and yet they couldn't make that connection yet because they didn't know enough about him by, by reading him into the created order. They needed something more. And so God, in revealing himself to men, gave them a fuller picture in Jesus. We find in John chapter 1, verse 14, he says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Finally, truth was made clear in the person of Jesus made true in the presence of Jesus, the, the way that he spoke about the Father, the way he presented the, the works of the Father, the way he communicated the heart of the Father, the way he related to the people around him, and especially the way he presented himself as the substitute for sin by dying for us on the cross and making a way to, to have peace with God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was the full expression of God to us. He was the full and accurate and clearest presentation, the manifestation, the display of God for humanity, the glory of God encapsulated in fullness in the, in the life and person of Jesus Christ. And so, in response, the beloved Apostle John says in his letter in 1 John chapter 1, Verses 1 to 3, he's, he's almost exploding at the thought of, of who this glorious Jesus is and, and what he has to do as, as a person to present Jesus to others. He says, that which was from the beginning, 
which we have heard, which we, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And this, by the way, is the automatic impulse of those who have been truly captured by glory. They will then proclaim that glory to others. Because to be captured by glory is not only to know Him, but to make Him known. You become a reflection of Jesus Himself. The, the character of God through the power of the Holy Spirit begins to show up in your life and transform you. To change you. You have become a new creation. And so everything is different. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Because of the work of God in your life. And so you come to know him. And you come to make him known. <laughs> there is no other option for those who are truly captured. By the glory of God. Captured by the gospel. So how does this process begin? How does this process begin for those who are truly captured by it? And we could go to Genesis all the way to Revelation to begin to, to dig into the expansive wonder of the glory of God. But as I look through the, the, the breadth of the scriptures, there is one place. There's one place that is a hot spot for glory where the, the concentration of glory is to the max, and in that this is the, the place in all of the Bible where the word glory is used the most in, in, in the entire Scripture, and that is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and 4. We find 11 times in one chapter, chapter 3, where the word glory is used, and then two times in the same chapter where glorify is used. Those of you who have the ESV, you're going to be at a disadvantage because in verse 18 it says, from one degree of glory to another, but the Greek is actually from, from glory to glory. So if you're trying to check and make sure that I'm telling you the truth, um, just know that look at the New King James. It actually has all of those words translated for you. It is the hot spot of glory. You want to see what glory will begin to do in a life? Well, last year, the theme was renewal. And, 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 and that is what happens for those who are captured by, by glory. That's the product. They, they want to keep coming back to the, to the well to experience the same refreshment that, that comes in, in God. But to take a step back, I, I, I want us to see what being captured by glory, how it begins and what the product it creates. What are the results? In chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, we, we find something significant about Satan's chief objective, which is to conceal the glory. Now, that should say something. If Satan's main mission is to conceal God's glory, you would anticipate that as the primary opponent to the things of God, that it must be significant, and certainly it is. We find in chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, it says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them, and here it is, from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Jesus as the full expression of glory, the, the representation and likeness and image of God himself, Satan's chief objective is to conceal that from view, to hide that so that you can't achieve the thing which God made you to do, and that is to glorify God. And so, in contrast, we find in the next couple of verses that God's ultimate desire is to reveal his glory. In verses 5 and 6, it says, For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Christ 
Jesus as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So if the glory of God is the manifestation of his presence among us, and it comes in the form of Jesus, who is the full expression of glory, full of grace and truth, then to know and to be captured by glory begins with knowing Christ. Being captured by glory begins with knowing Christ, knowing Jesus. And so I I ask the question, do you know Jesus today? Do you know Jesus? Have you had an experience with Jesus, a saving experience with Jesus? Now, what I'm not talking about is what we might say of those who would call themselves a chef, but all they know is the ingredients and they have memorized the recipe. But they really don't know anything about cooking. They don't know the heat they're supposed to use. They don't know how to mix the ingredients. They don't know what temperatures and what time constraints to use. They don't know what flavors work together. They've never spent a a day in the kitchen And yet they would call themselves a chef because they know the ingredients and they have memorized the recipes. That is not a chef. Just like maybe naming the parts of a car. And you can identify the, the various parts and maybe even describe the relationships between the pieces. You know where they go underneath the hood. But you've never once opened the hood And you've never once changed a part. You never exchanged the radiator or the water pump. You you don't know uh, the first thing about how to remove a spark plug or even to change the oil. That does not make you a mechanic just because you know the parts. The same is true about knowing Christ. Just because you know his name, just because you might know some verses in the Bible that describe who he is, Just because you might have uh, come to church uh, even for your entire life, maybe you can even uh, describe theology and defend certain doctrines. Your apologetics is, is beyond imagination, and yet you don't have a personal relationship with him. That means you don't know him. Knowing Christ is embracing Christ. Knowing Christ is coming to the place where you recognize that you need Christ. That he alone is the way, the truth, and the life. That there is nothing that you can do apart from him to merit any, uh, to merit any favor with God himself. That you are morally bankrupt. The technical definition is you are totally depraved. You add nothing to the equation. It is only a work of him. And so you bow before him. You come to the place where you make him your Lord and Savior. You confess that Jesus is Lord. You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And then salvation comes. Do you really know him this morning? Have you really come to embrace him as Lord and Savior? Or have you been captured By glory. A desire, a pursuit of life. To know him and to make him known. That's what we're talking about. And that's how it begins. It begins with knowing him. (laughs) But how does this process develop? How does it flourish? How how do we begin to to build this into our life? And so then we move back to to chapter 3 to kind of get some some idea for for how to begin to build these habits into our life. And and we recognize that right at the outset that that the Apostle Paul is is helping his readers to understand that, yes, God has always been about the business from the very beginning to the very end of making himself known. He is interested in his creatures knowing, worshiping, and glorifying him, recognizing that he alone is worthy. So we look back at chapter 3 and and we see how God has disclosed himself to his people. Beginning in verse 7 and moving 
to verse 11 and, and see if you can pick out and maybe underline for yourself the, the uh, expressions of glory that we read here. It says, Now if the ministry of death, carved in letters of stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of his glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Now here Paul is, is having a discourse trying to compare and contrast the old and the new covenant. This relationship that God sought to establish with his people way back at Mount Sinai. It was a conditional promise, a, a conditional relationship. It was based upon their obedience. God says, I will disclose myself to you. I will make myself known. You will be able to know who I am by, by hearing the law and, and understanding what holiness looks like. And then as you as people begin to, to recognize and align yourself and be obedient to the law that I have given to you, then a relationship can happen. But if you decide to, to distance yourself and reject the commands that I have given to you, then there will be no relationship. There will only be judgment and discipline for you. Well, that was a problem, right? And we find even in this passage that there was an inherent issue with the old covenant, this this old covenant relationship that came in stones, the, the tablets that Moses brought down for the people. And even though it came with an apparent glory, Moses' face was shining because of his, uh, his being in the presence of glory. There was, among the people, an inability to do what God had called them to do. We find that the glory of God was too terrible for the people. The manifestation of God was, was too difficult, too hard. It made them afraid and cower. We find in even verse 7 here, they could not even gaze at Moses' face. They couldn't even see the reflected glory. They asked him, put that away, Moses. Put, put, a, put a veil over your face. It's, it's too much for us. And we saw a couple weeks ago that even the presence of God on the mountain was too terrible. Exodus 20, 18, all the people saw the thunders and the flashes of lightning and, and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. The people were afraid and trembled, and they stood afar up. It's too much for us. The manifestation of God, God's glory, is too much for us to bear. And the holy standard of God was too hard for the people to obey. Verse 7, again, it says, it was a ministry of death. Which means no matter how hard they tried, it always led to failure. Yeah, you and I know something about that. We see the, the blemishes in our life. We see the bankruptcy that happens. We, we, we see ourselves stumbling into sin and, and just ashamed and embarrassed at a life that can't seem to progress at times. This was, their, this was their experience as well. And, and, it, and it led them to condemnation that we see in verse 9. A ministry of condemnation because no matter how hard they tried, they could never measure up to the standard. It was impossible. Perfection is impossible. Holiness is impossible. But what we do learn is something about the example of Moses. Moses, who was also broken, you know, and I know as we think about his story, we understand how broken he was, and yet he, he pressed in to relationship with God. He was willing to allow God to expose his hidden parts and reveal the things about him that were broken and out of step. And he continued to press in. And there were some things that we find about Moses and, and how he continued to cultivate this pursuit and a love for the glory of God. 
And we don't have time to, to dig into the passages, but just by way of, of, of introduction and, and uh, encouraging us in this process, I want to just read the passage and, and point out briefly what we learn. First, I want you to understand that Moses was able to be captured by glory because he treasured it. He treasured God's glory. That's how it was able to develop. He, he came to understand how significant it was in comparison with everything else that he had going on in his life. We find that in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 to 26. It says, By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. You want to grow in your relationship with God? You want to be brought forward in maturity and developing an affection for his glory? Then you need to treasure it. You need to see it for what it is. You need to look back on 2020 and understand that the gift of God in stripping certain things away from you was to help push to the forefront the things that really mattered, the things of himself, so that we can begin to see, yes, he is worthy of my affection and he is truly one who must be treasured. Moses had everything at his disposal from a human standpoint. He had power and position, prestige and authority, all of the, the wealth of Egypt at his, finger, at his hands. And he, he realized something was missing. Something was deficient. For all that he had, there was something that he was missing. He recognized here in verse 26 that it was much better to experience reproach of Christ than the wealth of Egypt. If we want God to help us to get to the place of being captured by glory and growing, taking it from one step to the next, we must come to the place where we realize nothing else matters. Nothing else satisfies. Nothing else is good enough. There's, there's nothing in life I want to pursue. There's nothing in life that I want to have than Christ. That's how it began in Moses' life, and it carried him to the next step. There was a treasuring of God, and so because there was a treasuring of God, there was a pursuing of God. He, he knew where the source was. He, he knew where he could go to find the, the glory of God. He knew how he could get filled up. He, he knew that he was made for something bigger than Egypt. And so God begins to, to, to welcome him into relationship. And, and Moses is happy to comply and he presses in. He doesn't ignore the voice of God. He, he seeks to pursue it for himself. I, I want more. Well, the, the little I have is not enough. I, I want more of you. So we, we find throughout the, the book of Exodus, leading from, from chapter 3 all the way to the end, we, we find this interaction taking place between God and Moses. There's, there's this, this conversation that is happening. The Lord speaks and Moses does. The, the Lord says something and Moses responds. There's this dialogue that is happening, but even that is not enough. He, he, he gets to see God at the, at the burning bush and, and he just is, is encouraged and blessed by the presence of God there in reality with him. But even that was not enough. And, and so it presses him in to, to wanting to know God more. So he sets up this tent of meeting that we find in, in Exodus chapter 33. And, and we find that Moses has set this up for anybody in the camp to enjoy. You want to experience the presence of God? Go out to the tent of meeting. But instead of participating, Moses would go and all the people would stand and watch. They were just spectators. They weren't participants. They got to see the effects of God's glory in Moses' life, 
but they weren't willing to pursue it for themselves. We find in Exodus chapter 33, and, and particularly as we come to, to verse 14, there is uh, this desire in Moses' heart for something significant about this relationship with God. Moses says, excuse me, God says to Moses, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Moses says, God, I want more of you. I'm not satisfied with what I have. I, I want to press in even more. And God says, I'd love to do that for you. I, I would love to give more of myself to you. I, I would love to make myself known even more to you, Moses. You ask for it, I will give. And that, that's the promise for us as believers too. Draw near to God and he will what, church? He will draw near to you. That's a promise for you as well. Do you want God's presence to be known in your life? Then press in. Pursue. Seek after him. But Moses wants even more. And this dialogue continues in chapter 17. So the Lord says to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight. And I know you by name. But Moses says, okay, we've taken another step. I want your presence, but, but here we go. Got something else to ask. Moses says, please show me your glory. Let me experience you in your fullness. I, I want to know you in totality. I want to see you and worship you for all that you are. So God says, okay, I'm happy to do that for you. But you cannot see my face because no one can see my face and live. And so we have this experience where, where in chapter 34, the Lord descends in a cloud and stands with him there, proclaims the name of the Lord. God says, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. God's glory passes by, and what we come to experience and understand, it is more than just radiance. It's more than just brightness. It's more than just the, the, the spectacle of God's brilliance. It is the expression of who He is. A God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy and steadfast love. God's glory is encapsulated in his essence and nature. It is who he is. It is the, the full expression of his, of his character to the world. And so when we see and hear in this passage the glory of God, we, we must think not just about radiance, but we must think this is God's nature that he is sharing with us. The Lord passes by, but he is sharing with Moses all the things about him that make him truly glorious. So when we think about God's glory, and we couple that with an understanding of John chapter 1 verse 14, that Jesus was full of glory, the glory from the Father full of grace and truth. It is that Jesus is the full expression, expression, the essence of God showed up in Christ. And so when we behold his glory, the glory of Christ, then we will begin to reflect that glory as Jesus did. Jesus reflected the glory, the identity, the character, the essence of God. And so those who are called by his name, who have the Holy Spirit living within, will begin to reflect that glory. We see that, and we'll look at this more next week in 2 Corinthians 3.18. 
And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So what does this look like? What are we talking about? What we're talking about is that the glory that God seeks to cultivate in your life is a glory that points to Jesus. So that when people see your life, they say, ah, that's how Jesus acted. That's what Jesus said. That's how Jesus cares. And that is the, the nature of Christ. There is the gospel in physical form. There is a person who is willing to lay down preferences for the sake of love to the people that God has put them in community with. There is a group of individuals who love to be together and worship together and stir one another up to love and good deeds. And so when they see you in the workplace, they say, there's a person whose life is dominated by an affection for Christ. And so as we look through 1 Peter, we're going to see the same kinds of, of evidences. That as servants are submissive to masters, they are doing that as to the Lord. <laughs> you see how, how everything in life, when you're captured by glory, it is oriented in such a way that you're pointing to Him. It is not glory for you. It is glory for Him. And so that when you get to be with Him, someday you can lay that glory down and you can say, God, you are so worthy Thank you for how you used your glory in my life to show people who you really are. So when we shine his glory, we shine Christ. We shine his character. We proclaim his praises. We believe in his promises. We reflect his behavior. We speak his word and follow his directives. And we orient every part of life in such a way that he receives worship whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, you're doing all to the glory of God because that is what you're made for. And that is when you will find and experience the greatest joy and satisfaction when Christ is the final and ultimate and supreme objective of life and orders everything about you. Oh, may God help us to be captured by glory this year. Let me pray. God, we're so grateful for your self-disclosure to us. Your revelation of yourself in creation and in the person of Jesus Christ. Who was the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus himself who captures our hearts and who reveals to us, who, whose light shines into our hearts to call us to glory. Oh God, may our lives showcase our love and devotion to you. May you receive the glory and honor that you alone are due. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming this morning. God bless you as you go this week.